There's some common nail gun mistakes that you can make. And they can ruin your projects, waste your money, or even injure you. Now I'm gonna tell you what each of those are and how to avoid them. The most common mistake that I see, and this is especially true for people just getting into air nailing, they're not really sure what it is, is not understanding which size nailer to use and which type nailer to use. I own three different gauges of air nailers, all the way from a 15 gauge trim nailer to a 23 gauge pin nailer. A 15 gauge nailer is also referred to as a trim nailer or a finish nailer, and also there's a 16 gauge variety, which is very, very similar. So these shoot a larger nail. This is a two and a quarter inch trim nail. This is a legit fastener. You don't need glue to hold it in place. This has a nice head on the nail. And you do see that these are angled. So it's great for installing door jams, trim, baseboards, things like that. Next up is the 18 gauge nailer or the Brad nailer. Love that one. These are 18 gauge and I have cordless as well as pneumatic varieties of these. And I'll tell you about the pros and the cons of these a little bit later. But this shoots a much smaller nail. This does still have a head to it though, but these are generally smaller in the 5 8 to about two inch range. So this is great for general purpose. This is the nailer that I use the most. The 18 gauge is definitely the workhorse. That's the one that I would recommend if you're a beginner and you just want to have one nailer to start off with. It's great for attaching small trim or cove mold onto projects. You can install quarter inch backs or bottoms onto drawers or onto the backs of cabinets. You can also do things like shoe molding on baseboards, all kinds of things like that. And it's great for just general home DIY as well as the woodworker. But the smallest of these is the 23 gauge or the pin nailer. And it gets its names because it actually has pins versus nails. So this is a headless pin, 23 gauge. You can see how tiny it is. It just has a bevel on one side and there is no head on the back end. So it is a pin, not a nail with a head. And what that means is that the holding power on these is very, very small. So these are for very delicate items. And the nice thing about this though, is it leaves a very tiny hole. So if you wanna have this on the face or the surface of a finished project, this hole that it leaves is gonna be much smaller. And speaking of which, let me show you real quick the difference between these three in both noise when I use them, as well as the size hole that they leave. So if you need max holding power, you wanna use a 15 or 16 gauge nailer. If you've got the delicate stuff, use the 23 gauge nailer with some glue because that is not gonna hold it in place. And an 18 gauge nailer is kind of right in the middle, but you do wanna use glue with it to make that wood on wood connection really solid. But now let's go to mistake number two, which is what is the right size nail to use if I'm using an 18 gauge nailer? Within each gauge of nail, there are also different lengths of nail, just like there are with screws. In my shop, I have a whole range of nails that I use from three eighths to three quarters, one inch, one and a quarter, one and a half, and two inch brad nails. And that's because it all depends upon the size of the material and the orientation that you're joining them together. So my rule of thumb on how to choose nail size depends upon orientation. If I am face joining two pieces together, then I need to make sure first and foremost, I don't blow through the back side. So if I'm joining two pieces of three quarter, for instance, that is an inch and a half thick. I would use an inch and a quarter nail just like I would a screw. So that gives me a quarter inch safety net to make sure that I don't blow through the back of this. So along that same line, if I was attaching a quarter inch piece to a three quarter inch piece, that's an inch of total thickness. I would use a three quarter inch nail for that same reason. Now, when we're joining a board perpendicular to another board, you obviously have a lot more room because the length of the nail, it's not gonna blow out the back. So you've got a little bit more leeway. I like to increase the size there and go two to three times the length of the material that I'm attaching. So if I'm joining three quarter inch material to three quarter inch material, I'll typically go an inch and a half and that'll give me a full three quarter into the board. But if I'm going quarter inch onto three quarter, even half, if I only use two X, that would be a half inch nail and that wouldn't give me a whole lot of holding power, only a quarter quarter of an inch. So there I like to go more like three X and I'll go up to a three quarter or even a one inch nail for this, sometimes an inch and a quarter because I just don't want to change the nails. You just don't want to go way too long and use like a two inch nail because then you'll increase the chance that you'll blow out the side of it. Before I jump into this next tip, I want to give a shout out to The Honest Carpenter. He has a video on nine mistakes for brad nailers and I actually found that video after I had already scripted this entire thing. I watched this video, it's got some great tips in it. I'll have a link down to it below. So now that we have the right gauge nail and the right length nail, we're in the clear, right? Wrong. Not so fast, my friend, because mistake number three is overdriving or underdriving your nail. And that's all about the settings on your compressor or your nail gun or the combination of the two. 
So let's start with compressor settings. Now every nail gun that runs off of a compressor on it somewhere, at least if you still have the stickers on it, it'll have the max PSI and maybe even the minimum PSI. So you wanna look at that and make sure that you're setting your compressor within that range. So let me show you the difference between setting it at 70 PSI and setting it at 120 PSI and what that looks like on a piece of wood. So I've got my small air compressor here and the number you're looking for is on the outlet side, not the tank side. So the outlet side will always be smaller. Mine right now is set at right about 70 PSI. So I'm gonna nail this in here and we'll see how, how deep it goes. So this is just on the surface and it is just under, but barely, barely under. I almost probably can't even fill that hole because it's, it's basically flush with the surface. I'm actually gonna crank this down to 50 just to show you what it's gonna look like if it's under firing. So at 50 PSI, it definitely underdrove and that is proud of the surface. Now I'm gonna crank it up to 120 and let's see where that goes. So that drove significantly deeper. I'll give you a close up here, but the one that is proud, I'm gonna have to drive through, and the one that is deep, that may be too much. So if I had something like quarter inch material, I'm gonna use that at the 120 PSI setting, and we'll see what happens. So this drove pretty deep, and I would say it probably drove almost halfway through, and I bet I can just pull this straight up. So if you drive it too deep in quarter inch material, you basically lose all your holding power. The other way to control how deep the nails are going is through the little adjustment on the nailer. Now, most of them have this, not all of them do, but this one has a little adjuster here that you can turn the knob and that basically moves the driver up and down to help it drive further or lower. And if you have a cordless nailer, that's the only adjustment you have because there is no compressor, it is all on board and there's just a little wheel here that you can adjust that moves the driver pin up and down to push it down more or less. If you don't have one, I would highly recommend picking up one of these uh, what the heck is this thing called? Spring loaded. <laughs> if you've got a brad nailer, you're gonna wanna have one of these, which is a nail set. You can get a regular nail set, which you use with a hammer, but this is a spring loaded one, which is pretty cool. So it's got a small end and a large end, and you can just put that right on top of the nail that you need to set, and then spring it into place and then it's all done. I'll have a link to this and all the nailers and compressors I've been talking about down below in the description. And speaking of cordless nailers, let's go ahead and jump into the fourth mistake, which is buying the wrong setup. You don't wanna spend money on things that you're not gonna use or is not right for your setup. So there are definitely advantages to the pneumatic side as well as to the cordless side, but you need to think about what's right for you. The big thing you wanna ask yourself is how do you wanna use these tools and what other tools might you use? If you're planning on using a lot of different nailers like a 15 gauge, an 18 gauge, and a pin nailer, then buying one compressor and making the investment and then getting the tools for cheaper is gonna maybe make more sense. If you're only looking to get an 18 gauge brad nailer and you've already invested in a battery platform, then this would, could make a lot of sense as well. I've used both pneumatic and a few different types of cordless. The performance of cordless nailers has come a long way and they perform just as well as the pneumatic brothers. Now check out this clip of me using bump fire mode on the Milwaukee versus the Ryobi. The Milwaukee can go as fast as I can fire it, but the Ryobi still does keep pace. And at half the price of the Milwaukee, it's a good deal. Now for pneumatics, the price per gun is gonna be cheaper, but then you also have to buy a compressor. But what size compressor do you buy? So the size of compressor is gonna, again, depend upon what you wanna do. This is a one gallon, and that is very light. You can take it around and do punch list type stuff, work in different environments that uh, you can't haul a normal large compressor up. But if you wanna do any type of spraying or any type of air tools, you're gonna to need a much larger compressor, one that would have 60 to 80 gallon capacity because those tools like a die grinder or something like that takes a lot of air. So make sure you look at the CFM requirements, which is cubic feet per minute of air for the types of tools that you're gonna buy and make sure the compressor you're buying can supply that. The last thing to think about on pneumatics is if you're gonna get oil-free or oiled nailers. I've had this finished nailer for well over a decade. It is not oilless, so I have to add oil to it every time I use it to keep everything lubricated inside. This is a newer one and this is oilless. I don't have to add lubrication to it at all. So you might wanna think about that as well to decide if you wanna deal with the hassle of oil. And while we're talking about maintenance and lubricants, I wanna thank today's sponsor, WD-40 Company. Their specialist line now has the iconic blue and yellow can with a red cap. 
You've seen me using the dry lube spray and I've used that on hinges and on my saw blades to keep the dust off them. And they also have silicone and lithium grace lubricants. And those are great for metal on metal connections and where you really wanna make sure that you're waterproofing and getting a high performance of lubrication. On the other side, they have the gel lubricant. It can stay for up to 12 months. It is a great option for outdoors and vertical surfaces. And of course, there's the WD-40 multi-use product. I have sprayed this on so many things throughout my life, whether it's a lawnmower, a skateboard, or my car, to help loosen and lubricate things around the house. Now, you can check the link down below in the description to find out about all the WD-40 Specialist line, and a big thank you to WD-40 Company for sponsoring this video. The next mistake I see is people ruining their projects because they're filling their holes the wrong way and the finish turns out horrible. I'm gonna pop a couple nails into this and I'll show you what I mean. I'm gonna fill one with wood putty and the other with glue and sawdust to show you what happens. So after it's dry, I'm gonna now sand away the putty and the glue. So the mistake here is not sanding enough because all of that glue in that wood putty has gone everywhere around that nail hole and it is on the wood. And if you don't sand it enough, then it is gonna show through on the stain. And I'm gonna apply some stain here to show you. But before I do that, I'm gonna show you a trick on how to solve it so that you've only got the putty on just the portion where the nail is gonna be. All you need to do is get a piece of blue tape and put it over wherever you're gonna brad nail. I'm gonna put a nail in here as well and then cover this one with wood putty. So now when this is dry, we can just take off the tape and all that excess is gonna go with it. And I'll clean that up with just a few swipes of the sander. And now I'm gonna apply stain and see how it looks on all three of these. I've got some dark ebony stain just to see if we can get the most contrast out of this. <laughs> all right, check this out. Look at how dark it is over here because there's none of that extra putty and dust filling the pores and so the pigment can come in there from the stain. Versus over here, it's, it's a little lighter and you can really tell over here on the putty side where I didn't get it, there's a nice little circle, but it's also just a lot lighter all around there and then the glue as well there. So if you are gonna fill holes on your project and apply a stain or finish, make sure that you get all of that extra dust and everything off around the nail hole or you can use the blue tape trick and just have a little dot and it won't affect it at all. Now the last mistake is probably the most common and the most dreaded, and that's blowing a nail out of the side of a board that you're nailing into. So there's a few reasons why that happens. Let me show you and I'll show you how you can avoid it or at least help make the chances less. So I'm just gonna shoot nails into this poplar board. Uh, I'm not gonna try to attach anything to it, just to show what's going on. The first thing I want you to notice though is the grain direction of this board. So it's kind of coming at an angle. And that's part of the issue is that the nails want to follow the grain. Now some of the obvious reasons of why blowout can happen is the positioning of your nail gun. If you have it too far to the edge or if you don't have it vertical, if you have it tilted to the side, it's gonna blow out. And that could look like this. And there we go, it just came out right on the side there. I'm gonna break in here for a bonus tip. Always, always keep your fingers away from where you're shooting the nails. I actually made this video because of the comments that I got during my drill charging station build where people saw me moving my fingers away right before firing the nail gun. Now I've never gotten a nail in the finger, but I've been very close before. And ever since then, I have always done this. So make sure you stay safe out there. I'm gonna move this to the center and do the same thing even at an angle and it will probably not come out. So as long as you're going in the center of the board, even if you're at an angle versus coming over even just a little bit, you can save it from poking out. But even if I keep it vertical, if I have it to the edge of the board, the grain direction might push that nail out. So I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna keep it vertical, shoot it on there. I'm gonna put this up next to the edge, but keep it nice and straight. There you go. That was just a little bit further over and you see it just came right out because it's following that grain and it's wanting to shoot out. So keeping the nailer vertical and going towards the center is definitely gonna help. But here's the tip that's really gonna save you and that has reduced the blowouts on my projects almost down to none, is not to shoot in line with the board, but to shoot the nail perpendicular to the board. And I'll tell you why. So I showed you some close-ups of the nails earlier. And what you might have seen is that they're kind of like a two by four in the sense that they have a wide face and a narrower width. So what that means is that the nail is gonna wanna bend to the left and the right as you're shooting the gun and looking down the barrel because it does not want to go up or back because of the nature and the width of the nail. So if we know that the nail is gonna go left and right, then we need to turn our board so that it can go to the left and the right and not blow out. So I'm gonna come right up on this edge, very close. 
And look at that, it did not go anywhere. It was even closer than this last one that blew out, but it did not go out the edge. So keep your nailer perpendicular to the board that you're nailing into, and it is going to drastically reduce the number of blowouts that you have. If you like this tips and tricks video, I've got a playlist queued up for you with some more right there, and YouTube thinks you're gonna like that video right there. I wanna give a big thank you to all the folks joining the FTBT Builders Club. You can get more information down below, and I'll catch you guys over there on the next video. We're gonna build something awesome.